Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another fantastic episode of my favorite book. Tonight, we're going to hear from Eric Ruin. Um, I hope everyone's doing well. I hope you're staying cool in this crazy June heat wave. Uh, my name is Monica. I work for Brooklyn, and I'll be your host tonight. Um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that the land from which we're broadcasting is part of the traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape people. We ask you to join us in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. <clears throat> Brooklyn Inc. is a nonprofit organization located in Brooklyn, uh, New York. We're celebrating 22 years of promoting artist books as both art, uh, primary research materials, and tools for, ju for social justice. We distribute work by artists and organizations within the academic market. We host workshops and exhibitions. We publish books and archival box sets. And if you want to know what an archival box set is or just more about us, you can check us out on our website, which is bookland.org, or you can follow us on uh, at Bookland Art on Instagram. I also want to take a minute to thank our sponsor for this event, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, and I just have two quick announcements before we segue to Eric. Uh, one is that we are super duper excited to share our, um, our newly edited and redesigned education manual. Um, if you haven't heard about it, it's a really great resource for teachers or for anybody who just likes to do arts and crafts. Um, you can learn how to do a pamphlet stitch, an accordion fold, um, and a ton more. There are six different uh, bookmaking techniques, and there's tons more lessons for each of those techniques. It's been collectively made um, over the last 17 years at Bookland, and it's totally free, and we encourage you to download it and share it with everyone. <laughs> you can find it at linktree slash Bookland. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to thank everyone who came out to the zine jam at Old Stone House in Brooklyn on Saturday. It was a beautiful day. We had a great time. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to Interference Archive who joined us and brought their amazing mobile archive bike. Um, and thank you to Jan and Elvis for facilitating. Okay. Um, <laughs> we are so excited to be doing our first serialized online program, my favorite book. Uh, we ask 18 different artists to quickly tell them about their favorite book that they've ever made. Uh, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday throughout the month of June, we'll have a new episode for you from 7 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, you can check out our website for a full schedule and drop in any night you would like on YouTube Live. Um, so tonight we're... Uh, <laughs> We're also very excited to introduce Eric Ruin, who is an old friend of Bookland's. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, A Threnody for the Dispossessed, a, an epic and beautiful book, one of our favorites. Um, I'm going to read a quick bio about Eric, and then I'll hand it over to him. Eric's going to talk for 15 minutes, and then we'll have a brief Q&A. So as you're watching and any questions that pop up for Eric, just write them in the chat, and then when He's done talking, I'll channel those to Eric. Um, okay, so Eric Ruin uh, is a Michigan-raised, Philadelphia-based printmaker, shadow puppeteer, paper cut artist, et cetera, who's been lauded by the New York Times for his spellbinding cut paper animations. Um, his work oscillates between the poles of apocaly apocalyptic anxieties and utopian yearnings, with an emphasis on empathy, transcendence, and obsessive detail. He frequently works collaboratively with musicians, theater performers, and other artists and activist campaigns. He's a founding member of the International Just Seeds Artists Cooperative and co-author co of the book Paths Toward Utopia, Graphic Explorations of Everyday Anarchism. His current projects include the Ominous Cloud Ensemble, an ever-evolving, collectively improvising large ensemble for projections and music, which at times has included members of the Sun Ra Orchestra, Bardo Pan, and Espers. Um, I can't wait to hear from Eric, and I'm going to bring him on now. Hey, Eric. Hi, thanks, Monica. How you doing? Um, good. I'm here in my somewhat sweaty uh, basement studio in Philadelphia, inside my apartment uh, in West cool. Philly. I'm gonna. I'll hand it over to you. I'll get out of here. Awesome. Thanks. And thanks to Bookland, they've been a 
great help to me in uh, my career, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to present a piece called A Trinity for the Dispossessed. It's the most ambitious uh, book project that I've ever done. It's a 60-foot art, silk-screened, uh, printed-by-hand artist book that exists both as an accordion book, which, which is this guy, and as a scroll. So originally, the whole thing was printed as a scroll. Um, it's some of the editions stayed as a scroll, which then is going to be performed as a cranky with usually a live musical and uh, audio collage accompaniment, but also can exist in the form of a book. So I'll show the book off in just a second here. Um, Authority for the Dispossessed was created uh, as part of a larger project called Friends, Peace, and Sanctuary uh, that was initiated by librarians at the uh, Swarthmore University uh, and was funded by the Pew Center. And uh, the remit that we were given as commissioned artists um, was to uh, work with folks who had been resettled in, who had chosen to resettle in Philadelphia from Syria and Iraq, um, mostly folks who were fleeing war. Um, initially, the cohort was formed around people with refugee status, but it's not such a legalistic frame for that. So uh, we did a long series of workshops, teaching book arts and other techniques, uh, art making to uh, those people, and then encouraged them with and provided a little bit of guidance and advice in making their own work, which was really amazing, which was then jointly exhibited with the folks who were commissioned um, in a series of exhibitions all across Philly, in Swarthmore, and in Brooklyn at Brooklyn. Um, yeah, and so I don't have, don't necessarily need to get too much more into that. Uh, the larger project, it had a bunch of really beautiful iterations um, and continues to be a community to this day in the form of a newspaper formed by uh, Yarub al Abadi and Nora al Marzuski, um, that is using the uh, kind of a lot of the connections that came out of that project. Um, and yeah, has uh, continued to form a bunch of beautiful collaborations and relationships uh, over the past couple of years. So that was a project that I believe was initiated in like 2018, and the exhibitions were at the end of 2019. Um, for my uh, part of that project, I created this artist book. Um, I was really interested in using my uh, skills, <laughs> knowledge as a silk screen artist, combining them with my uh, background as a puppeteer and creating so it would both be a performance object and a book object. Um, so I took a bunch of research uh, based on um, just the theme of displacement. So working with the archives there at Swarthmore, uh, looking at specifically kind of three threads of things. So there's like the um, displacement uh, over the course of World War II during the Holocaust, et cetera. Uh, there's the dirty wars and the displacement kind of uh, surrounding the political tumult in the 70s and 80s in Latin America, which they had a large, large collection of documents. And then uh, first person oral history interviews that I conducted with the people in the program and in the broader community. Um, so that ended up turning into this giant map of different ideas. So each foot of the scroll, which is 60 feet long, um, has a corresponding uh, bucket of uh, block of text to it. So in order to create this, I transcribed all of this research I had done, color coded it for different thematics. So like trauma, survival, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then kind of intuitively pasted that together to form this larger sort of text map for the piece, which then lives on both in terms of this accompanying booklet, um, that's part of the project where each page is given uh, its corresponding text, but also it was an audio soundtrack that was uh, layered by my friend Julius Masri, uh, who is a great Philly musician. Um, yeah, so when we do it live, usually I'll do it on this thing, and then he'll do live music, and then we'll play the sound collage um, that's based on the interviews. We've had a bunch of really wonderful experiences doing that. So yeah, so this guy is a big folder. Um, they're each cover to it as individual. Uh, this was assembled by my friend uh, Megan Gibbis at Long Arrow Bindery in the Bay Area. Um, so that's basically just a giant hard case folder. And then here's the actual object. So this is the accordion book version of the thing. So I think it works best if I slide it towards the center. So um, the initial theme that I wanted to work with was just this: these uh, billowing clouds of smoke because one thing that I heard over and over again from folks in the program 
uh, was the experience of just waiting forever for their refugee status to be approved or for them to be allowed to move uh, to another country because often you have to wait in a third country before you're transferred uh, was akin to just sort of an endless limbo experience. And I thought about that as sort of like this endless fog that people would be finding themselves in. So um, this section includes lots of war imagery, uh, people talking about traumatic experiences of losing their loved ones. And then this larger sort of what I call like the myths of limbo. So uh, in this case, there's these figures, I believe it's, yeah, the figures in blue are uh, based on old photographs from Ellis Island. And the uh, pictures in purple are from more modern migrants from the Middle East. So yeah, I don't know. I think you can get the, like with this light, you can get that it's like a really heavily silver <laughs> section here. It's a very, very shiny section. So I think you're, it's getting a little cropped on that side. So yeah, moving through this sort of fog of war, fog of waiting. Oh yeah, this page size here is, each page is like a 24 uh, by 36, is that right? Uh, something like that. No, 18 by 24. Yeah, so each page is basically the size of what I would traditionally do as like a poster print. Um, yeah, so let's see lots of layers here. Um, there's some talk about the ocean, there's some metaphorical stuff about that, um, which, you know, you can listen. Oh, you can listen to the soundtrack on SoundCloud. I keep meaning to say that, but uh, I'll try to uh, remember to post that link somewhere. You can find it on my website. Um, yeah, so wanted to find a way to talk about um, just the atrocity and dehumanization of this moment in a way that wasn't doing a disservice to how horrific that is, but also wasn't uh, glorifying or dwelling on that. So I kind of these masses of figures for my attempt to work on that. It was funny, I had a bunch of back and forth about the different color values of this section um, and eventually ended up putting these giant transparent um, washes of like gold and orange over the top just to um, sort of rectify some of the color values so they were less jarring next to one another. Maybe you don't need to know that. So it goes, I don't know if you can hear it, but my cat is snoring in the background. Um, so, and then this was, uh, part of an anecdote about uh, people humming uh, silent, very quietly with their lips first in order to uh, madden the guards um, at the concentration camps where they were being held, which I thought was really beautiful. They would m uh, hum church hymns and stuff like that. And the guards would be able to tell where it's coming from. This is like my fun with color mixing section. Let me move that over a little bit. Um, so, and this section was based on uh, one of the participants, Abdul Karim, was telling me these stories about when he was held in an Iranian prison. Um, and he would take apart the uh, clothes and bed sheets and things like that and weave them back together um, out of you know whatever he could find, actually using as a needle to do embroidery. He would uh, take bits of the fencing that was surrounding uh, the prison camp and sharpen them and then create them and then use them to create embroidery needles. And then they would constantly be having to like bury or hide these things under their beds, things like that, so the guards wouldn't confiscate them. Um, eventually, some folks were asked to do handicrafts for some of the prison officials. This is a larger section that's very heavy about people, uh, you know, making their own choices about life and death. I'll dwell on that with a text from uh, all the three different threads that I have mentioned before. Um, here's a section, it's a really uh, beautiful section from one of the women in the program. Uh, based on a story from one of the women program at Mall, uh, talking about the help that she was given where she was waiting in a ditch while uh, migrating from, uh, I believe, getting over the border from Syria into, uh, I want to say Jordan. I'm um, sorry. I know I have that written down, but it's been a while since I made this. So, um, And this beautiful story of a guard helping her get across, um, a border guard helping her get across the border. More anxious waiting. Based on more specific story about people being hid from different military authorities. Uh, more uh, footage of devastation. This is kind of a collage based on several different Syri cities in Syria and Iraq. Um, this section looks really good backlit. Um, you can kind of see the figures that are buried. So it's the figures from the previous uh, sections that are then buried inside the buildings here. 
This is all very metallic and shiny. And here is, these are two of the women who are in the program. Oh, sorry, uh, Layla and Amal here. Um, so Amal actually, we had a funny text back and forth uh, while I was composing her portrait because I made an initial version of it and she didn't um, care for it very much. So I had to go back to the drawing board and revise it and put it back together, which I was actually really grateful for because it's a, it's a much better likeness and just in general, a much stronger image. Um, so that's the fun part about, you know, um, collaborating with people's stories when they're alive and can tell you what you think they think of your work, um, which is always really special. Um, Layla depicted here, I believe, on, yeah, I was gonna say on my left, yeah. Um, your left, yeah, um, was a really special woman who was a poet. Um, she lost three different sons to sectarian conflict. Um, was one, just a really funny and lively person. She passed away from cancer uh, just a few months ago. Um, she was really special. When we did this, our first performance of this as a performance, she narrated the whole thing. Um, she would just sit there quietly, or not very quietly, uh, tell all of the stories related to the larger uh, scroll to whoever was sitting next to her. And it was always really uh, special to me and though at times a little distracting. Um, the way that she really saw herself reflected within the larger project. Um, here's another, and I'm blanking on the name. This is based on, this uh, image is kind of based on some historical accounts of people um, dealing with PTSD, uh, following the Holocaust, there's a specifically a uh, specific anecdote with a, a Holocaust survivor's name who I'm uh, sadly forgetting right now um, that this image is based on, even though that no, photographic evidence of her. So it's like kind of putting a couple different sources together in a more associative collage. Uh, here's Layla again. It's a section where she talks about poetry being the breath of life. Section about the many helping hands. And this is the Burgess family um, on the uh, left here. Sorry, the directionality is killing me. Um, who were a family survivors who have a very complete letters, um, who were a family of Holocaust survivors whose complete letters and photographs are held, it's worth more. Um, and it, there's some really uh, beautiful documentation, like a hand-drawn map of Bergen Belsen, um, a bunch of uh, really moving letters back and forth to a, a class in Swarthmore that actually had sort of adopted this family uh, following the war. Here's a section where folks talk about the freedom of nature. And then here is the end of the book. It just kind of ends in this abstract patterning here. Um, so yeah, that's the book. Um, I think there was like a number of questions for me in terms of how I wanted this to be portrayed. And in the end I chose rather than integrating the text into the book itself, um, by like, you know, directly drawing lettering on it or anything like that. I really wanted the images to sit on their own as like a wordless narrative that could be more broadly applicable because it was attempting to weave all these different strands together. I really didn't want it to be limited to like what you would see immediately and for people to be reading the text more than they were reading the image. So I chose to incorporate um, all of the textual component of things and the source material that things were derived from in the form of both this booklet and in terms of the uh, musical accompaniment. So I really wanted them to be able to be perceived on their own, um, which is very important to me. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you ever get to see this in person, you can read all this text. Um, like, like I said, uh, the uh, entire soundtrack is on SoundCloud. So what we also have here, which I'll just is so I don't know how folks are familiar with something called Cranky. It's a puppetry form that's popularized by Brent Puppet, as many puppetry forms are um, in the modern day and age. So basically, it's also known as a moving panorama. It dates back to the Victorian era, though, of course, sort of like uh, visual storytelling is a very old tradition. And there's uh, lots of different ways of people telling stories with scrolls. But basically, the way this functions is that. 
the musical accompaniment will be playing while I will be less squeakily than this turn through the piece. I like that this also allows for a different sense of pacing and a flow of images that's really distinct from the pagination and sort of the limiting of pages the way those create a frame. So I can choose when to stop it, creates a frame. But you also get to see, I think, more clearly the way one image flows into the next. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you guys could hear me over the uh, squeakiness of that thing. The thing needs to be oiled. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that's been 15 minutes. <laughs> Hey, I'm back. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you've accomplished 15 minutes. You did it. Okay. Congratulations. I talked very um, fast. So I tend to cover ground really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> very efficient. Um, I'm just going to share some links quickly um, that you had uh, mentioned while you were talking. This one is Eric's SoundCloud link. So you can hear the Threnody soundtrack at this link. Um, you know, while I'm doing links, why not just do it all? So here's Eric's <laughs> information. You can follow Eric at, on Instagram at Eric Ruin and ericruin.info is his website. And let's just let's just do one more. <laughs> here's, here's another link. Uh, it, 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 <laughs> I don't know why that came to me. Uh, so just go to this bit.ly link, Threnody Now, and um, that's just a link to Bookland's website. We have a listing for Threnody, and that has some really fantastic images and more uh, you know, metadata about, about the work itself, if you wanted to see that. Um, so here, I'll just leave that one up. Let me check in with the chat. Um, no comments right now, but I have some com or uh, some questions for okay. you, Eric. I mean, one just generally, I'd like to know what you're working on now, and like, what's next for this book, or maybe this is a project that sort of had like its beginning, middle, and end, and and now you're working on other things. But uh, let us know what's going on um, with what you're doing next, and then also where can we see performances online or maybe in the future of this book. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's like a little excerpt of it with with the soundtrack um, that's on my YouTube channel. If people just look, just search for Eric Ruin on YouTube. Um, there's a bunch of other performance footage, so of Ominous Cloud, which Monica mentioned at the beginning, um, of different, of another, there's another book that's kind of in a similar format to this. And for me, this was a really inspirational project because there was a bunch of support behind it, but then I, once I developed those tools, I realized I could use them to like just continue to be making uh, artist books in a similar format. So like both could function as a cranky scroll performance and as a book. So there's another uh, performance that's very similar to that called Letter from Isolation, um, which is based on a text by Ulrike Meinhof. Um, that's, you can see, I think a full shot of that. That's really beautifully shot from a rooftop films event in Brooklyn. Um, and with a musical company by Miles Donovan and I, Smavael. Um and so, yeah, so there's a bunch of performance stuff there. People can check it out. I have, so Letters from Isolation is the first in a series of what I'm kind of right now calling uh, Letters from Germany of artist books. Um, so there's one that just finished, and I think it was just shipped, the raw scroll was shipped to Brooklyn, to Brooklyn just the other day, and is being currently bound and folded by someone else, because I'm not good at that, um, uh, which is, uh, called to those who to all to those who come after. I always forget the name, but it's based on a Brecht poem um, about World War II um, and the Dark Times. Um, yeah, uh, the Dark Times is a phrase he uses recurrently in this series of poems. Um, and then there's a third one that's in the works right now. I was actually supposed to be working on it this summer at a residency in Canada, um, but that got canceled because of COVID. Um, based on the letters, the prison letters of of Luxembourg. So kind of looking at the history of Germany um, from say like the, you know, 30s through the 70s as like a lens into like the trials and tribulations of our modern era and specifically of our modern America era and sort of wanting to get into some, uh, there's some like, for me, there's like a thematic there, which I don't know if is immediately apparent that's about whiteness, right? I'm thinking about like what it means to like actually 
give oneself up to struggle. I think Ulrike Meinhof is a really interesting example of that, though I'm not going to say her actions were per se laudable. Um, yeah, so there's that series. There's like another little book that I'm making right now that should be done maybe tomorrow. Um, that's based on a sixth century uh, text from a, Ro a Roman scholar named Cassiodorus, but that also like has all this relevancy to climate change. Um, I'm about to go in two weeks to go teach a course called Speculative World Building and Screen Printing at Oxbow, um, which is that's full, so people can't go to it, but it's a thing that's happening. Um, yeah, and then uh, some more Philly area performances coming up, other things like that. Uh, and I've been doing this, I've turned to animation during the pandemic uh, because a lot of the performance stuff I was doing couldn't be done live and I didn't want to do like a pale shadow of that. So um, I've been doing a, in a bunch of different collaborations with musician friends, it's all on my YouTube page. Um, but there's also one particular project that I want to highlight, which is called Practical Abolition, which is a, um, a collaboration with the Almost Odd Law Project, who are a really amazing local act abolitionist activist legal collective here in Philly. Um, and we've been doing these very, both very utopian and very quotidian things about different ways that abolition can be enacted in everyday life. So there's two of those that are out now that you can find via Amistad. And then there's two more that are going to be in the works soon. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, well, Eric is free for a, a residency this summer, but it looks like you filled your schedule just fine. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. So thank you so much, Eric. Thanks for sharing everything. Uh, this has been really interesting to me. I've seen this book many times. I've held it in my hands and, and this has really opened up a lot of understanding for it. So now when I go back and look at it, I think I'm going to have a lot more to bring to it. So thank you for that. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. So I just want to remind anyone who wasn't here in the beginning that you can download a free copy of Bookland's education man manual, which was newly designed and newly edited. And here's just a quick flash, another link. <laughs> you can get a copy through the link tree slash Bookland. Um, and those are just our regular details. Um, again, thank you so much, Eric. It's been really a pleasure to see your face. I haven't seen you in person in so long. This is. I'm good with this. This is a step. <laughs> <laughs> and tomorrow night, uh, let's see, this will be, this is the fourth episode. Tomorrow's the fifth episode. We're going to be talking to another Just Seeds co-founder, uh, Josh McPhee, who's going to tell us about a book called Security, which was about uh, security systems in uh, South Africa. So please come back for that. And again, stay cool. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Eric. Thanks. Take care, everyone.